Alaska Insight is supported in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers just like you. Thank you. From subsistence hunting to wild berries, tribes have been living off the land here for generations. What are the benefits of traditional Alaska native diets and foods? We'll discuss it tonight on Alaska Insight. Subsistence is deeply tied to Alaska Native culture. Traditions and delicacies vary among tribes and villages. When people must travel to an urban area for medical reasons, it can be difficult to find their cultural comfort food outside of their region. In Anchorage, the Alaska Native Medical Center runs a garden that helps provide some of the healing plants of home to patients from rural Alaska. Alaska Public Media's Zakia McCummings reports. Tucked away on Alaska Native Medical Center's campus, there's a wandering display of greenery that includes informational placards. Along with South Central Foundation, ANMC has cultivated this traditional healing garden, growing everything from fresh fruit to medicinal plants. Angela Michaud is a tribal doctor with ANMC's traditional healing clinic and helps run the garden. We have yarrow and wormwood and devil's club, which are three guardian plants, and so those three plants are used for healing, um, both internally as a tea and as a salve. And so when you put them all in um, together as a salve, it's used for wound care, um, chronic pain, um, bug bites, and also as a bug repellent. Dr. Michaud says ANMC's traditional healing clinic aims to educate their patients about the plants. Last year, the hospital offered classes in the spring and in the early fall. So there was one class every week um, for 11 weeks to go through the plants as they were blooming. Um, so a lot of the stuff that you can cook with is when they first come out. And then like the berries, the jellies, the jams obviously are going to be in the August, um, September time. Each class is a little different depending on what's in season. But one thing remains the same. Students learn not just how to forage traditional plants, but how to prepare meals, teas, and salves from them. So like when the fern first comes up, you can actually use the fiddlehead and saute it, eat it like you would like an asparagus. Dr. Michaud's job is to make sure the traditional foods are prepared in a healthy way. And she says her clients ask for tips on living a healthy lifestyle. When we started doing the, the yearly plant symposium class, people were so interested and they said they wanted more. And so now we added more classes just because of the demand. The job has even been an education for Michaud herself. Over the course of her time at ANMC, she's learned a surprising use for one plant in particular that shed light on its versatility. Fireweed, it turns out, is an excellent burn treatment. Dr. Michaud learned about its healing properties through personal experience. I have affinity to the fireweed now just because it helped me. And I don't, you, you don't even have burn marks anymore on my hands, whereas um, it actually went all the way down to the muscle the burn did. So. Um, it actually has some really good healing properties to it as well. South Central Foundation will be hosting traditional fusion classes during the month of March, including three classes about how to make your own plant-infused soda. To find out more information, visit the South Central Foundation's event page on Facebook. In Anchorage, I'm Zakia McCummings. Joining us in the studio this evening to discuss the benefits and the preparation of Alaska Native traditional foods is Amy Foote. Amy is the executive chef for the Alaska Native Medical Center in Anchorage. Hi, Amy. Hello. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Also with us is Melissa Klupatch. Melissa is an assistant professor of dietetics and nutrition at the University of Alaska Anchorage. And uh, Melissa, you specialize in traditional foods. Yes, I do. Fantastic. We'll learn more about that. Thanks for being here. Amy, let's talk about your role as executive chef at AMN, ANMC. 
How do you incorporate traditional Alaska Native foods into the meals that you're putting forward there? So we start by by what I could purchase and what I can buy that was Alaska Native um, or Alaskan grown, so to speak, um, like wild caught Alaskan salmon, reindeer, that sort of thing. And then we also have a donation program that's set up um, on people that are willing to share sort of their harvest, whether it's their plants or, or their um, hunt. and um, it's seasonal. It depends on what we get. Um, some years we have uh, herring eggs and some years we don't. Um, some years we have a great fiddlehead fern crop. Last year fireweed was was crazy. It was everywhere in the state so we, we were able to do a lot with that. So it's really based on kind of what um, what we can harvest, what the earth is giving us and, and, and what is donated. And how about the training for your staff? What does it take, uh, what has it taken to get people sort of up to speed and how to take food uh, that they may not be used to incorporating into meals, especially in a hospital setting, and, and yeah. using those? Yeah, it, it gets, um, it, it can be a challenge. Um, I find that our best teachers are those that are standing next to us. So uh, we do a lot with um, native hire and Alaska native hire. Um, we work with elders. Um, any chance that I have to go to a potluck, I go and learn and learn different prep you know, preparations on that. Um, we have kind of a kitchen lab in our kitchen regularly where we're learning to break down whether it's a moose leg or a seal or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Melissa, you helped start this program that Amy runs now at ANMC. Tell us about the origins, how this got started. Um, well, I uh, started working at ANMC, gosh, uh, I think it was about 2006. As the, I started off as the patient services manager in uh, the kitchen and we had a small menu uh, with traditional foods but we wanted to amp it up and I had worked with different managers but it wasn't until 2014 the it wasn't until the 2014 farm bill got passed where it had specific verbiage about donating traditional foods in institutions like a federal institution now the state of Alaska food code has had that in there for years, well before the farm bill. And then uh, Chef Amy came on board not too long after the farm bill was passed, and she helped make my dreams come true. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great to hear. <laughs> Let's talk a little about that, that carve out in the farm bill. Uh, what, how does it um, allow for food donations that aren't being processed by some licensed facility? What, how does that work? to keep can talk uh, to the food safe. safety kind of piece of it and so it's very much like um, anything that you would get either way if you're getting a whole chicken in you're gonna assess it to make sure that it smells good that it's good quality that it doesn't have parasites that the skin's not yellow you're gonna do the same thing with with g game meat um, the verbiage the way that it keeps it I guess a little more safe is that it doesn't allow for it to be processed so you actually can't donate ground meat and that's for species identification. It's also the more you process something, so if you're grinding something, you're creating more surface area, mm. which is potential bacteria growth exposure. So that's how that verbiage kind of keeps it safe. Again, if you're working in a kitchen like I do every day, anytime you get a product in, you're gonna assess it for food safety, and it's not any different, like I said, between a moose, a seal, or a chicken. You're just gonna look at it and make sure you know that animal know what it's supposed to look like, and know what the dangers are. So when you say not processed, you're not getting like uh, a seal, an unskinned seal, are you, or are you? No, no, we haven't, okay. because that is a very <laughs> coveted part of the seal. And so um, most of the time, if I get a seal donation, um, it comes in and it's it's been skinned. Um, sometimes the most coveted parts have been removed, like the flipper. Um, if it's a moose, a lot of times it will be a full quarter a big couple hundred pound moose quarter. Um, uh, Brainy Pass Lodge had donated to us last year a couple of caribou and so it was it was all the legs and... Wow, so yeah. you have a, a setup to process it right there at mm -hmm, AMC? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if it's something that I can't handle the volume on, um, the uh, Larson Bay Lodge out of Kodiak um, has a lot of hunters that come in and hunt deer and um, they don't take um, their meat always and so they 
helped get with us and I think we had like 14 deer come in at one time and that was just too much for me to process in that period of time and so you know we work with other vendors to help us get that processed and but again we keep everything we keep the bones we make we make bone broth out of them you know we don't nothing goes to waste mm -hmm. that's actually part of our policy is to nothing goes in the landfill so if we had you know something that we didn't feel like we could use then we would donate to the zoo or to the wildlife conservation center or or the raptor rescue so it'll go back to you know the polar bears could have their own traditional foods yeah. it, it seems extraordinary that you're doing all of that you're not just getting supplies in like I think most people anticipate kitchens do. Mm -hmm. Supplies come in from some supply chain, it's already prepackaged, and you're just putting it together and cooking it. How unusual is the way that you're dealing with this, these donations um, uh, of foods compared to other places in the country, other IHS facilities or other I think centers. we're pretty unique. I can I can proudly Very. say that we're, um, uh, and it's not just the traditional items, but a lot of places have gone away from making their own baked items to, um, and we do thousands of fry bread a day, um, to soups, to any of those things are coming in very much processed and prepackaged, and we do as much from scratch as possible. So I do think that it's pretty unique. Um, obviously, the proteins that we work with are a little bit different, and some of the plant life is a little different, but um, I think also just having the knowledge base and the comfort level to, um, to be the first ones to step out and try it, um, or to you know, serve seal soup to your patients, because mm -hmm. that's what makes them heal. Yeah, and one cool thing stuff. that um, Amy and I do is we we've presented on the Alaska traditional foods mov movement locally throughout the state and nationwide, and folks we we did one presentation at the Native American Nutrition Conference in Minnesota, and people couldn't believe what we were doing, and so um, it's definitely uh, something that that we are advocating and telling folks that all around the world that they can do. And um, ANMC is definitely unique. Uh, I helped start um, a program at Mount Edgecombe for search and then uh, Manilik uh, Association at their healthcare center has the Sigluk, which is a traditional foods processing facility. So there are a handful of places that have done uh, a spin on the donation program mm -hmm. and ANMC has just done above and beyond setting some gold standards I think for others to follow. So you're seeing some of this uh, kind of ripple out across the state mm -hmm. and, and uh, as you noted you saw a lot of interest outside of Alaska. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing uh, efforts at starting up similar facilities outside of the state? I think in Canada we're seeing it a little bit more and um, I think down south, uh, we're seeing it, it, maybe not necessarily, well, in, I actually helped implement one uh, program in one of the hospitals at uh, San Carlos Healthcare Facility. So uh, again, they're setting the gold standard down there. It's starting, so, yeah, starting it's in other starting. places. I've seen a lot of farming and kind yeah. of that piece, so things that you can cultivate. You know, it's a little bit different mm -hmm. <coughs> in Alaska because of just kind of the heavy mammal diet that's just based on on the climate honestly and, and where you know they're harvesting it from and so you know the, you don't see whales in Minnesota so that's obviously not a traditional food but the acorn and some of the other plants that you could cultivate would be um, does that make sense so it, you, sure. we are seeing those things happen but they're it's, it's different because it's where their harvesting is different what they're eating is different and there's we're seeing more of a revitalization of indigenous foods down south Absolutely. as well. How long has that really been um, part of, it, it seems like it's, it's huge that it was part of the Farm Bill. What has that meant? Just that l kind of legitimizing that these foods are important and they're valid to incorporate into, into uh, diets in, in a more institutional setting. What does that mean? What, have, what kind of feedback have you gotten from people about the importance of this? kind of reclaiming um, their culture for a lot of folks, especially um, in areas that have been, you know, really pulled out of that. And so the act of going out and harvesting or, or hunting or gathering or doing those things with your family um, have gone away just due to, 
you know, life in, in our country's history, frankly. And so you'll, f you'll see that there's kind of this resurgence of grabbing your roots and your history and your culture. And that part is the emotional and the spiritual healing. And that's what we see at the hospital too, right? When we're giving someone a bowl of, of moose stew and it makes them think of the time with their grandma or hunting or gathering or being with their auntie instead of being in the hospital in the city. And decolonizing, I think that's a word that's been um, really out there over the last few years where various tribes, reservations um, are trying to decolonize, so to speak, and work on that revitalization of their foods, of their cu culture, of their traditions, and doing culture camps and things like that. Well, uh, decolonization, as, uh, as you were just referencing, uh, in years past, probably not so much in Alaska, but certainly in the lower 40 and on reservations where people were, you know, taken out of the, uh, taken away from the ability to do a lot of that hunting and gathering and, um, and were given commodity foods, they were called, um, heavily processed cheeses and white flour and, and um, uh, things that weren't really that good for you, that kept you alive, but as we've seen through the generations, a lot of health uh, impacts have sprung from that, diabetes and, and other things. Mm -hmm. What do you think we'll see over the next decade or so? How quickly do you think you'll be able to really start to measure um, that decolonization effect on people's health and their well-being when it comes to being able to not only access those foods, but going through the physical exercise and the spiritual exercise mm -hmm. of getting out there and actually, you know, getting them to yourself and, and that satisfaction that comes from that sort of that self-reliance. How long do you think it'll take now? This farm bill has been out for a little while, mm -hmm. but a few years, but um, when do you think there will be some measurable results? Uh, I think, personally, I think it's gonna take a little bit more time. Um, I think Alaska is definitely ahead of the game where we have our culture camps and, and we have our elders educating our younger generations and being more involved. Down south, it's, uh, they're, they're getting there. And um, it's amazing that there are so many people have, who have no idea about their pre-reservation, their indigenous foods. And it's, it's baby steps mm -hmm. right now. And, um, but I think for our Alaska Native um, population, I think we can probably start measuring that in the ne very near future. Mm -hmm. I think there are, are a lot of research studies that need to happen, and we do need to do more um, nutrient analyses on various traditional foods. I mean, the last analyses really were when um, pioneer dietitian Betsy Nauman did her work for Indian Health Services, and that was back in the late 80s and 90s. So yeah. I think we need to revisit looking at the nutrient analysis because these foods are, um, they're natural, they are nutrient dense, uh, and, and not only that, uh, and being nutrient dense, it'll help uh, combat the diabetes epidemic that we have, obesity, getting people out there and getting physically ac active and that social aspect too, and helping with mental health and, um, and just moving forward with that. It's amazing how just the, the idea of food is so much more than just, you know, caloric intake and, and feeding your belly. It's, it's <laughs> like this really holistic part of, of someone's life. Mm -hmm. And it seems like we're, gaining back that knowledge that may have been uh, kind of just steeped in, in all culture mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. generations ago and kind of fell by the wayside when modern conveniences came The refrigerator. The yeah. refrigerator yes. changed a lot just yeah. throughout um, the world, honestly, and, and the way that we harvested and preserved and took care of, you know, um, items. And I think, um, I think generally, generationally, we're going to look at there's, there's a, and I hear this all the time that, you know, my auntie and my grandma know how to do that, but I did, they didn't teach me that. And so it's a relearn and then teach to continue mm -hmm. the process. And 
our <coughs> elders aren't going to be around forever, and they're the ones that have this knowledge and have these stories. So we need to take as much in as we possibly can so that this doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. So important. Uh, Melissa, you're teaching at the University of, of Alaska Anchorage at UAA, um, focused on traditional foods. You recently won a grant from the National Resource Center for Alaska Native Elders. Tell us about that grant and what that means and how you will use it. It's so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a uh, uh, $10,000 grant that I'm going to use on a very special project. Um, I'm going to work with Beans Cafe in implementing a traditional foods program. Really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, tell us a little more about that. Flesh that out for us. How, what, uh, what prompted that idea it, to go there and do it there? So uh, Beans Cafe is, um, for the first time ever, taking on our dietetic interns. And when I met with the program director, uh, Scott, he, uh, he had talked about, in addition to having the interns implementing a traditional foods program, because more than half of their uh, population that they feed are Alaska Natives. And about 40% of that, um, and these aren't um, measured numbers, but this is what uh, we believe uh, are elders. Mm. And so it's really important that um, th this is a, a population that really needs to heal as well. And for them to have their foods, one, they'll get nourished, which is so important because it, it, it's such a, um, it's a population, it's an at-risk population. Two, it'll help with mental health. Three, it brings comfort and then a sense of home. It just seems like there's such a connection then to, uh, it, as you said, mental health and, and that uh, recognition that, that there can be a lot of pride in, in seeing these foods and validating their importance to someone, uh, both their cultural importance but also the sustenance that it provides mm -hmm. for them. That just seems huge, kind of hard to measure. Amy, how do you, we saw the story about the traditional plants, the medicinal plants. Mm -hmm. How do you incorporate those from that traditional healing garden into your menu? Yeah, again, so it depends on, you know, what the harvest is and what we're, uh, what, what the earth is kind of giving us at that time. Um, I prefer to use things when we can get them fresh, but very much like you would live a, a subsistence lifestyle, you take what you can, you use what you can, and then you preserve for later. And so um, when fiddleheads are in season, we use as many fresh as we can, and then we pickle them or we freeze them or we try and stretch them so that we can have them throughout the year. Um, you know, if, if it's a... Uh, um, sourdough, I've, I've been working with sourdough a little bit in different ways and you can freeze it. Um, it doesn't can real well that I've found yet, but you know, some of it's just playing with those uh, traditional um, preservation methods and trying to, again, make them fit in a commercial institutional healthcare kitchen. So that's kind of my magic is, is taking it from, you know, the hillside or, or the village and making it in a healthcare commercial kitchen. Mm -hmm. Recipes and, and methods vary mm -hmm. widely from Absolutely. region to region. <laughs> how, do you, uh, how do you incorporate that into what you're doing so that people do have that satisfaction when they get that? Do you interview people about, well, how do you prepare it here? Or mm -hmm. how do you find out? Sure, absolutely. So, you know, if we get a donation, a lot of times I'll ask them if it's someone, if it's coming from a village, if it's coming from, you know, um, a hunter, I'll ask them what they do, um, you know, in Ketchikan, if our seal comes in, I, I have, you know, talked to them about what, what they do. Again, it's meeting with elders, it's going to different potlucks. If we get um, she fish from Kotzebue, I got to actually go fishing for she fish that we donated to the hospital. It was a blast. I had so much fun. <laughs> she Best went day without work. me. Yes. <laughs> Best day of work I've had. But 
it, um, you know, learning those recipes um, and uh, talking with, but if you talk to several different people, they'll give you different ways they like she fish. Some people prefer it to be in their gudak, some people prefer it to be baked, some people like it dried. Um, and so it's learning all of those different um, ways that people prepare, whether it's, you know, hooligan people, some people smoke it, some people render it down and, and use the fat, the oil from it. So. Mm -hmm. It's just learning all those different nuances. And then, um, you know, I think because at the hospital we're supporting the Alaska Native population as well as the American Indian population for the state. And it's, um, it, it's trying to find that balance. And if it comes from um, that area, I try to cook it in a way that it would be from that area. Mm -hmm. So you don't often see us like co-mingling, you know, caribou and um, seal. It's they don't run side by side. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, in just a few seconds, are there uh, some top two or three all-stars that are like kind of the superfoods of traditional plants or foods that are out there? Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> uh, seal is definitely one of the ones that's on top of the list. Three ounces of seal have about 80% um, of your daily value of iron. So it, it's full of iron and, and we have freeze. a an issue with anemia up here as well. Um, let's see, seal oil is mega o omega-3s, uh, full of omega-3s. And then I need to include a plant in there. Let's see, um, wild Alaskan blueberries have more antioxidants. I was just going to say that, blueberries, yep. Yep. my favorite. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the taste and aroma of food we grew up with can trigger powerful memories. Some dishes offer pure comfort and others aid good health and promote healing. When someone is lonesome for their family comfort food or the food of their region, getting access to it can improve their overall sense of well-being, especially for those who are far from home and facing health challenges. Providing traditional food helps them feel connected to their home life and elevates their spirit. That emotional component alone can speed recovery. That's it for this edition of Alaska Insight. We'll be back next Friday, right after Washington Week. You can find past episodes of the show and related content at our website, alaskapublic.org slash alaskainsight. Thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Lori Townsend. Good night.